All right, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome back to our Michigan Bicentennial event at uh, Materials at Michigan. It's my great pleasure to introduce our first speaker for the afternoon, my colleague, Professor Ted Goodson uh, from the Department of Chemistry. Ted's the Richard Barry Bernstein Collegiate Professor of Chemistry, Professor of Macromolecular Science and Engineering, and Professor of Applied Physics. Ted got his uh, bachelor's degree at Wabash College in Indiana, where I learned from an M-STEM Academy dinner over the summer. He tells me he was equally skilled in jazz music as well as chemistry. Uh, I believe that to be true. Uh, he decided, though, in that sort of fork in the road uh, moment in his career to go off and to continue with chemistry. Uh, so he got his PhD from the University of Nebraska and then did postdoctoral fellowships at the University of Chicago and the University of Oxford. Ted has many accomplishments, uh, two that I'll highlight here. He's a fellow of the AAAS, as well as a Distinguished Faculty Achievement uh, Award winner here at the University of Michigan. And in terms of designing how the future will be made, I think Ted's gonna talk to us today about some of the fundamental work that his group is doing in uh, ultra-fast spectroscopy applied to uh, metal clusters. But from some of that fundamental work, uh, Ted has discovered, and his research group has discovered, a class of organic superconductors. Uh, so he's applying materials at Michigan that started as basic studies in ultrafast spectroscopy in his lab, that he's now started a, a company, Wolverine Energy Solutions and Technology, translating that chemistry from the bench uh, into practice. So Ted, it's my honor to uh, have you speak this afternoon. Well, thank, thanks, Bart. Can you hear me? Um, so yeah, that is true. I, I did uh, study um, music and um, chemistry at uh, Wabash College. Um, my parents, who, who you know, who were chemists, you know, had their doubts about my music career and, um, and told me, "Well, you know, there's always chemistry, right?" And so uh, here I am. Um, so I want to tell you, um, thanks for the wonderful introduction and thanks for having this meeting. We were just talking just a, a few minutes ago about um, all the great materials research that's happening not only in chemistry but in engineering and across campus. And um, maybe this will be the kind of genesis uh, event that will kind of gel some future interactions. Um, you know, people like Rachel and us and myself have been in um, programs in which we've had big centers and so on and hopefully we can do that again. I'd like to tell you a story about today, though. It's a little different than what I put in the abstract, um, about uh, two students who were materials slash physical students in my group. And it's about ongoing research for the last 10 years. And I think it's the kind of uh, flavor I think Michigan has to offer in terms of doing materials research. Um, not only are we interested in some great application at the end of the road, but um, we also do some basic science and we try to learn things and collaborate across campus. And this story is about these, these things called metal clusters. Um, uh oh, what happened there? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I just touched something. I probably wasn't supposed to. You had it in press. What are I supposed to press? Oh, to the right or to the down? Shouldn't matter. Do it again, okay? You have the magic touch. Um, so our, our research, for the most part, had been, and it still is, related to organic materials. And um, as you can see, um, you know, we do a lot of spectroscopy to understand how organic materials can be um, investigated for how, the, you know, the expectations in organic materials can be investigated for applications in diagnostics, um, where we looked at delocalization length and long range electric field strengths and so on. Um, we have a program with DOE still to look at energy uh, harvesting systems where we look at time resolve spectroscopy to try to monitor the process of energy migration in these organic um, um, solar materials. Uh, we have a project in quantum optics 
Um, and the project in quantum optics involves is, um, the use of um, quantum light or entangled light to do spectroscopy, um, where we can do spectroscopy at 10 orders of magnitude fewer photons than you would do normal nonlinear spectroscopy. Uh, all very exciting areas, as well as some uh, research in biological systems, um, looking at diagnostics in biological systems, and so um, um, where we looked at amyloids and so on. But I wanted to talk today about the work mainly um, of uh, a couple of people, um, which is kind of different from what the rest of we, we, uh, the group does. Uh, the first student um, was really interested in this area of research. His name was Sung Hai Yao. He was an excellent graduate student in chemistry, and he was both physical and materials, and he graduated. And the, and the second student is going to graduate, I guess, next month, um, is Rosina Wu. And so um, she's a material student. And they got interested um, in a project that um, was started by a postdoc named Ramakrishna, um, uh, who's now a professor at Western Michigan, um, on these small metal clusters. And um, if you don't know anything about the small metal clusters, that's great, because I'm going to tell you all about them now. And um, I think it's really cool kind of project because it's basic science and applications. So um, from previously, we had studied a lot of different kinds of particles that everybody in this room must know about. Um, you know, like gold nanospheres, uh, dendrobium nanocomposites. These were looking at metal particles which have like the surface plasma that you could take advantage of to do certain things. Um, the, this entire room must have heard about, you know, gold um, being a, a good nanoparticle for different types of applications. Um, then people started to make different kinds of topologies of nano uh, gold, like nano rods. Um, we worked at some nano uh, threads and so on. They make, this person called this a nano necklace, okay? And mm -hmm. so, um, but generally speaking, these were particles that were on the order of five nanometers or bigger. And they all showed this surface plasma. And so this slide is just to show you that it all started with people saying, well, it's interesting. Isn't it interesting that once you make the particles of about five nanometers or bigger, uh, they show these interesting kinds of particle behavior. And so, um, oh, that was working there for a second. There it is. Um, I think it's the battery. There it is. All right. So look, it's been found, though, that gold structures, materials can be broadly defined as, you know, bulk or insulators. So in general, you know, if you look at the bulk, if you talk about the spacing and the energy levels, if you're talking about the Fermi level or actually even talking more um, discrete levels, the spacing is much smaller than the energy of about KT at room temperature. Okay, so KT at room temperature on the order of hundreds of wave numbers, you know, the spacing is going to be much smaller. On the opposite end, like if you talk about an atom or a molecule, um, then the spacing is getting quite large. Okay, this is a spacing between electronic energy levels. And, you know, so the spacing is quite large compared to, you know, KT at room temperature. But interestingly, nanoparticles are kind of tiltering on the edge of this bit and, and far from this bit. And these nanoclusters now, these metal nanoclusters, if you will, are somehow in between this region. And um, people didn't understand how to describe this. You know, if you have this sea of electrons and you have the kind of, you know, classical bulk structure, um, generally speaking, you'd have some surface plasma and resonance, you know, the sloshing of electrons. But if you keep making the particles smaller and smaller, you keep changing the density of states, is it possible that you could have some, with looking at these kinds of particles, not making molecules, but looking at these particles, is it possible that you could have a band gap opening? And so um, people have looked at these kinds of things and found that, you know, if you use a simple my scattering theory, which most people do, to talk about particles, we don't have to talk about equations, but generally speaking, the scattering approach, which is based on the dielectric, can model for the bigger particles. You can see that you'll see from Maxwell's equation that you will get a surface plasma at a certain frequency, depending on the dielectric of the material and these other properties. And that's well understood. But what happens if you make the particle smaller? So people were doing things in about 1980s, late 80s, in the gas phase, making small clusters. 
And they could make these clusters in the gas phase by different methods under high vacuum. And they could make like gold five minus and so on. And they found that, okay, if you make particles that have um, this kind of dimension, uh, you can still describe them as the kind of nanoparticle behavior. But if you made particles that are smaller than this, um, of this dimension, um, it, it wasn't clear how to describe them. The my scattering approach seemed to fail. And so um, this left a really interesting question. Um, isolated events happened afterwards. When I say, what do I say isolated? Someone in Germany actually made a cluster of 55 atoms in solution. Unbeknownst to someone in um, Japan making a cluster of 102 atoms. Publishing in different journals, maybe don't even know the other one's doing this, right? And, and actually they weren't making it in the gas phase, they were making it in a beaker, okay? And, and then later someone um, made 140. Finally, someone, um, a couple of people, okay, um, made a cluster of just 25 atoms. And it's stable. But they didn't have any theory. Um, the structure was finally solved by um, Kornberg right here. He was at Stanford. And he said, this has got this interesting structure. We don't understand it. But somehow, um, you can make in solution these gold clusters of just 25 atoms. What does it all mean? They, they um, may term this as gold monolayer protected clusters. And, and the idea is that they'd have a single organic layer and that you, you know the synthesis could be re robust so that you can do this in the solution or solid phase. Uh, you could store it in powder. Um, and then you know the ligands would prevent some EM interactions. And these clusters can be functionalized through surface modification. You can see there's the surface ligands on the outside of this. But what does it all mean? And so that's where the interesting part starts. So um, a really famous paper um, in PNAS, mainly from a guy na named Rob Wetton, he termed this phrase the superatom. He said, well, you know, it's interesting. Um, if you can make a cluster that's stable with precise number of atoms, then it itself becomes a new atom. Yeah, that's, I think that's cool, right? Okay? And, and he said that, okay? And, and look, he said he predicted by this magic number um, that if you knew the number of core metal atoms, you knew the valence, and if you knew the number of electron localized ligands, and you knew the overall charge, you could predict where the next magic number would happen. Okay, and does anybody recognize these numbers? Yes, from what? Uh, yeah, I mean, this is basically, if you look down the table. And so since, you're, since you brought up my parents, and since you want to talk, you know, philosophy, they're actually, you know, they, they left science and got into theology and, and philosophy, and um, they're very interested in philosophy and so on, you know. And so this is so-called the alchemist's table. Has anybody seen this picture before? Okay. Except I've changed this picture, of course, right? And so this is called the, this is called the periodic table. <laughs> I have to do that in my classes sometimes, and people just stare at me, and it's, I have, go back to the basics, right? You know, okay. This is the periodic table, okay? And take that statement literally, right? It says, um, if you're able to make a cluster have the same properties as another atom, can we now start thinking about how we can have different clusters, build different clusters to mimic the properties of a new atom? And we can do this in a beaker. We don't have to do some high vacuum kind of laser absorption kind of experiment. We don't have to have a, you know, a accelerator at the National Renewable Laboratory or something, right? We can make some solution and build these clusters to have properties of some other system. Is it possible? And the answer, of course, is, 
is the point of this talk. So, um, you know, before we give you the answers, there are some benefits other than that great question. Um, these clusters would have interesting properties in catalysis, um, imaging, um, the so-called charge quantization, electronics and photonics, we'll get to all these things. Um, but other than answering some really important basic question about these metal clusters, um, they have some use. So I'm mainly gonna to talk to you about these gold clusters and um, how they're made. There's been a couple of methods. The one is called the burst synthesis and it's a phase transfer of a gold salt. So you start with the gold salt, okay? And um, you add that and then you have this, this gold three to, to one reduction. So you reduce that process and then you have the gold one to gold zero reduction. Finally, this is kind of a um, excess is actually removed from the flask. You can, you, you then actually mass spec these systems. Um, we don't just look at them, um, you actually measure the mass spec, okay? And they have 25 atoms. You can, you can follow this procedure. Now, they, this looks very straightforward. Yes, there are some details about how long you wait and so on, okay? Wait too long and it decomposes and so on. Um, this actually is a very stable material if you isolate the system and mass spec it. Another um, group has shown that you can do this inside dendrimers as well. Um, but the main point is that, you know, with these syntheses now, it is a pretty foregone conclusion that people can make gold clusters uh, in their laboratory. In fact, even um, uh, high school students in the summer can make them. That's a big deal, okay? It's a big deal that high school students can make them, but it's also that they can make it in the summer. All right, so um, the big clusters, I mean, the important ones that people spent a lot of time trying to understand um, from a chemical standpoint was this structure. It's a very strange structure. So um, it has 13 atoms in the middle, and then the rest of the gold atoms are in this staple geometry of gold, sulfur, gold on the outside. They call it a staple, okay? It's staple. These gold sulfur bonds are stapled to the outside, kind of hovering over the 13 core atoms, okay? And then the gold 100 has a much more kind of core shell structure to it. But a lot of people spend a lot of time on this gold 25. And so we said, well, we're really interested in the optical properties. We can ask that same question, can you make clusters have properties of others or are, are the properties of these clusters? And um, can we investigate their optical effects as a function of size or atom number? So for example, um, so now this goes back to Sun High um, and um, you know, he said, well, look, we, we were able to obtain the gold 25, the 140, the 309, and then some big particles. Okay, and actually we got the 55 as well. And you can see for the big particles, this is what you expect. This is called a surface plasmon absorption. This is the absorption spectrum. This is called the surface plasmon. As you make this bigger particle um, down to about 2,000 atoms, you can see the plasma is more broad um, but spread out. By making the first known stable magic number, 140, the surface plasmon vanishes. But it's still a particle. What does that mean? It means it's still a drop of metal. It's still uh, conductive, um, okay? You can look under the TEM and see a particle there. Um, when you get to 55, there's absolutely no hint of a surface plasmon, and look what happened at 25. Once you get to gold 25, peaks started to happen. It's still a particle, okay? Um, so then, um, you know, there's no surface plasmon. You get increased absorption features with a decreasing size. And then the, 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 the most important thing is that there's these the street transitions later correlated with time to, uh, dependent DFT calculations, suggesting that there was indeed confinement in these tiny clusters. Big deal. It means that uh, clusters actually can behave like molecules, if you will. And um, you could look at the fluorescence. 
So here's the normalized fluorescence, and this is for the use of gold. Let's get some fluorescence in the visible. But you can, you can read this statement. So gold nanoclusters are emissive in both the visible and the near infrared. And we found the quantum yields for gold nanoclusters are five orders of magnitude larger than what you would obtain for bulk gold. Five orders of magnitude. And um, if you look at the lifetime, these clusters kind of all aggregate um, in hundreds of femtoseconds and the gold, the big particles and um, with surface plasma are down around two, 20 to 30 femtoseconds. So it's at least an order of magnitude longer lifetimes. It really is a different emission and absorption process. They are different. And so um, we wanted to know more. Um, as you'll see, there's lots of interest in using these clusters and so on for breast cancer imaging and so on. We do this experiment in what's called two-photon absorption. It's basically a measurement of the transition dipole moment in these systems. Why is that important? Because now if you have a molecule, if you will, made of only gold, then its dipole moment should be gigantic, right? And, um, and if you look at the two photon process, it's basically a, a process in which two photons are, of the system are absorbed before one of them relaxes, right? You absorb two photons and you look at the emission afterwards, the so-called two photon absorption measurement, fluorescence. And you can see um, it's got some really strong two photon absorption out here in the 750 region. That's why there was some interest in looking at these for imaging. And it's good in the near IR. This cross section, which doesn't mean anything to you, but uh, you just have to take my word for it, is a very large cross section. So um, the cross section is a measure of how much absorption or you know, how strong the absorption is per, you know, I guess, molecule or atom and so on, right? And so um, this is an, a gigantic number. And so um, you know, this is about 10 years ago, and, and with that number, I would say that real interest in the optical properties of these tiny clusters began, okay? So um, if you look at the cross sections of these structures, um, and then you look at it from per gold atom, you can see that there's some kind of enhancement that happens because gold 25 really should not have had such a large cross section. What's going on? Um, then, as I mentioned before, um, we've worked with several laboratories, like in the DOD laboratories and so on, and they became very excited, and of course they inv uh, investigated these properties of these gold clusters as well, and found this very large cross-section, and they wanted to understand why. Well, one way you can try to understand why is to see exactly what's happening to the cluster, the crystal structure, if you will, of a single cluster, if you will, um, when you excite it with photons. So here's like a picture of a cluster, it's like a lattice, you know, okay? And when you, in comes the photons, um, you have some processes that are gonna happen that are gonna be the ultimate resultant of what you see in the end of that fluorescent. And so, um, so you know, you have some electron-electron scattering processes, and you have some electron-phonon relaxa uh, relaxation processes. And these all are important. So if you do the um, transient absorption kind of measurement, this is wavelength, this is absorbance. So if you do transient absorption, here's the absorption peak of the um, molecule to begin with. And so if this was just a surface plasma particle, a big particle, it would have this big surface plasma on here, and you would um, excite right in the surface plasma, and you would see some bleaching of that surface plasma. And, and if that bleaching happens, then you would see that the wings now look a little bit bigger, okay? So this so-called time-resolved transient absorption experiment was used as a measure of us looking at actually how much the system absorbed the photon and then how much excited state absorption happened. Well, what does that mean? So here's the experiment, right? So that's what I was saying. Here's where that surface plasma was originally, and it got bleached. And then the wings, they move up a little bit. And then you can watch that process happen in time. You can see, you know, this is the time in picoseconds. This is the change in absorption, the transient absorption. And, you know, the very fast initial process is related to some electron-electron scattering. And then the slow decay is related to this phonon coupling, meaning the lattice is moving. You know, some people always talk about like a chain-link fence, right? I kick the chain-link fence and then sometime later 
you feel what happens on the chain link fence down at the end of the fence, right? Okay, and this is what this is doing. It's like you imply an impulse to the fence. And so this electron phonon coupling is about 1.8 picoseconds, and the scattering of electrons is about 500. This is typical. People had seen these kinds of things in big particles before. Just a typical case. And in a typical case for the big particles, what you could do is just increase the power. You turn up the juice, you turn up the power, you increase the number of photons, you increase the temperature, right? And you increase the temperature, the time takes longer to decay, right? Okay, and so you can use some simple model then for the cooling of that electron phonon relaxation in the big particle that is related to the temperature divided by some um, cou coupling constant. And then the, the proportionality, of course, is the heat capacity. This is like basic you know, thermodynamics, okay? So big particles behave like you would expect. You heat them up with photons, right? They absorb the photons. And if you increase the temperature, the uh, time for the cooling of those vibrations and the couplings takes longer. And you can use the heat capacity just to, to measure that. However, in the case of clusters, that didn't happen. Okay, and so here again is the big particles in the red, and the blue is actually this, the absorption spectrum of the cluster, just to show you. And look what happens. Instead of seeing a bleach, you actually see these excited state absorptions. And this is the green, okay? We thought that was interesting. So there's no surface plasma on bleach in the case of these metal clusters. And you can see the excited state absorption um, out in this so-called semi-ring region. If you want to look at the time. So in terms of the time, here's the big particle again. That's what we, I just talked about. And then here's the small nano cluster. It's much, this is the small nano cluster. It's much faster in this region than has this decay, okay? So what does this mean? Again, I increase the power. I increase the temperature. Right? I turn up the juice. That should make the lattice vibrate stronger and take longer time to cool. Right? Um, and this is what you saw in the big particle, it's the red, which I have to do this kind of jiggle here. Okay, but anyway, it's the red, right? Um, but in the case of the cluster, there was no dependence. There was no dependence on it. You can increase the power as much as you want. If the resonance is not there, no dependence on the lifetime. This is the first evidence of some idea that you could have a band gap kind of relationship. And so instead of just having some um, a relaxation process proportional to temperature, right, it's actually proportional to the actual gap of the energy, if there's a gap that exists. At this point, we didn't even know. Okay, and so here's the um, electron phonon relaxation time, and here's the maximum frequency of the coupling constant. And here's the actual band gap. It says, if you use a band gap proportional to the absorption of one of those peaks in the gold 25 cluster, you could actually model this using this kind of approach, so-called energy gap law. Interesting. But we weren't done yet. We were saying, well, what if we were to try to see more closely what is happening inside those 13 atoms in the core? So Oleg Fornowski, who's a uh, um, research professor in the, in the group, did a very interesting experiment in which we use the so-called transient grating. Basically, it's a pump probe type signal in which we read a grating off the absorption of this system. And once the absorption grating disappears, that means the interaction between the phonons is gone. That's typical. So here's, here's the typical case. You have a big particle. Down here, it's this purple, okay? And as you um, wait a very long time, you'll see what we just saw before, you just decays. That's nice. But as you make this particle smaller, something interesting happened. So for the case of the 102, I think, uh, cluster, you can see, you started to see these kinds of oscillations. And then for the 55, you see the oscillations again. And then by the time you get to the 55, the oscillations are very strong. Again, this is basically looking at 
that chain link fence, right? Okay, you kick it down one end and it's doing this vibration as it goes down the energy level. Well, you can measure the, um, this acoustic vibration at 2.2 terahertz. This, so this vibration, so, you know, this is the period of that. This vibration is about 400 femtoseconds. And that's too fast to be excited by the relatively slow heating mechanism. So if it was just a heating, like in the big particle, uh, it could never relax in this kind of time scale. So it's, it's, but instead it was very similar to the so-called dissipative uh, coherent phonons, okay? Um, what does that mean? It means if you measured the frequency and you calculated the vibration frequency of one gold sulfur gold unit cell, you can calculate that. The vibrational frequency mode um, seems to be about the same as the unit cell itself. It looks like a molecule of gold, sulfur gold. Interesting. All right, and so uh, it is not uh, heating like you would expect in a big particle. Well, so in, you know, kind of this is a summary of, the, of what this means. We had evidence now that particles behave like we expect them. They are governed by the surface plasmon, which is a temperature dependent thing, but that these clusters now seem to be of a different nature. They're independent um, of this kind of um, uh, coupling constant of the um, electron phonon system and governed by the energy gap law. What to do then? Well, interestingly, we tried to model these kinds of things. All right, so you said, well, your, your pump probe shows that as you make these particles and clusters smaller, there's some kind of cutoff between the behavior. This is the transient lifetime, okay? This is the fluorescence lifetime, and this is two photon cross section, and you could do the same thing with absorption. So, you know, and it seems like a gradual small change is observed in the absorption. But all these experiments, along with the oscillations that I just talked to you about, suggest that this, there's something happening at about 2.2 about 2.2 nanometers. You're making this particle smaller and smaller till you get to about 2.2 nanometers and it appears that the behavior changes. And um, Sunghai was in Olek and uh, you'll see we're important in trying to come up with a model. Here's the bulk gold, here's the cluster. You're making this bulk gold smaller and smaller and smaller until finally it gets so small that you get this opening. So this, this uh, spherical oscillator model predicts um, that there's a linear dependence on the band gap, which is inversely proportional to the diameter. And so for the case of gold, um, you can try to use this so-called single particle Hamiltonian to calculate where that energy would be and where that size would be. And so it's, it's somewhere in the, in the vicinity of less than two nanometers. Um, interestingly, um, you know, people have used this kind of model else, elsewhere to do this in semiconductors as well, to find the new band gaps and so, and, and other systems. But the, the point of this slide is to say that um, while particles look like particles, as we make these particles smaller, <laughs> why particles look like particles? When we make these particles smaller, we get down to this size, their properties change dramatically and even their, um, description of their bands change dramatically. So um, this is a periodic table. And interestingly, now you can try to say that even though gold is sitting here, some might say it was starting to have properties that looked like other systems, okay? And um, you know, can the properties of models, um, or models be used for gold clusters for other transition metals. For example, if I looked and compared gold to silver, um, as you probably know, when we asked freshman chemists to write out the electronic structure of gold and silver, they can get most of the credit by just doing the following. So in the case of gold, they would put the inert gas and then the rest, right? And in the case of silver, you would ask them to put the inert gas and then the rest. These structures are actually kind of similar. Um, actually, the Fermi energy levels of 
of silver and gold are very close. Um, for all practical purposes, you know, don't tell this to somebody you're trying to get engaged to, but I mean, silver is just as good as gold, right? <laughs> okay, is it not, right? Okay, and so, but uh, it's a lot cheaper. <laughs> but, um, however, um, you could use some free electron model to calculate how this very small distance really doesn't make that a big effect, but somehow people believe that the properties of gold and silver are different. So, um, how different are they? Again, I go back to this interesting picture, it's all by Roger Kornberg of the gold st uh, staple geometry. 13 atoms, they're in this pinkish color in the middle, and then um, the, uh, the rest are in this staple geometry of gold, sulfur, gold. That's the geometry. We figured that, based on what I just told you, uh, that silver would be very similar. Um, and so um, the first silver cluster, magic number, uh, was this silver 14. And you can see um, this was the proposed geometry. Uh, unfortunately, no. This geometry of this uh, uh, solved X-ray structure was not similar at all. Okay? And so, um, how to in, describe that? So, you need another method um, to make these. So, Terry at uh, University of Toledo was the first to make um, very large quantities of this silver cluster. And so, um, you can see this is with silver nitrate. You can do the complexation and then you reduce that with the borohydrate and you make the extraction and you do this wash. And then, an interesting thing of using these kinds of page gels in which it gets stuck in the gel, the thing that you want, and you cut the gel and then dissolve the gel, right? So you capture, you isolate it and you capture it, and then instead of then going back to the original flask, you just cut the gel and then take it out of the gel, right? Interesting, okay? Um, and he was made, able to make the, the two known silver uh, magic number clusters at that time of 15 and 32. And so, um, well, what's so interesting about these is that these silver clusters had enormous fluorescence. Why? Why? <laughs> okay. And, and here, everyone in this room could have done this experiment, right? I mean, just by cutting that gel, and if you walked into a dark light room or something, I don't know, right, with the lamp, you would have saw this yourself, I mean, enormous fluorescence. It's, in fact, you know, we compare the fluorescence of silver particles to these clusters, and, you know, we said that the gold was about five orders of magnitude bigger. I mean, this must be six or seven orders of magnitude bigger. And the question is why? So we tried to understand those properties. Again, uh, excuse me, um, you know, do the basics, try to understand the, the spectroscopy of these systems looking at the bands, finding out where the absorptions are, um, and then trying to and, uh, eliminate different possibilities. Um, the, the geometry of this cluster was still a question, okay? So um, George Schatz at Northwestern was trying to solve this structure for the silver 15, as well as the 32. It's a very complex structure, and look what they found. It looks like an icosahedron inside an icosahedron. <laughs> crazy. This is crazy, right? It's real magic. <laughs> How did it get in there, by the way? I don't understand. All right, and so uh, he solved that structure. And, um, th you know, this was also done some calculations to find the, the, the properties of these systems, but we were still scratching our head. I mean, so we, we would like to go back to the drawing board and try to compare the gold 25 to what we see here. And so here, here's the gold energy states I just told you about, right? So, you know, some ground state and some visible emission. There's some surface state emission. So you have the core 13 atoms, and it's known now that the emission is coming from those outside staples, gold, sulfur, staple, gold, sulfur, gold. All right? So there must be an energy transfer from the non-radiator processes to these surface states, which then is the emission that we observe in our spectrometer, okay? Um, for the case of silver, it's completely different. 
even though the electronic structure, the actual, if you count electrons, the Fermi energy levels, all of these things are very similar. Uh, for the case of silver, is actually looking different. We were surprised. So actually, you have some uh, exc excitation to the core state. That's similar. But then there's some fast relaxation to the so-called dark states. And so the case of 32, this dark state only lasted for less than a half a picosecond. And in the case of silver 15, it lasted for five picoseconds. But then, of course, you still have energy transfer to these um, surface states or metal ligand emission states. Uh, but then you get a relaxation that's on the order of 130 picoseconds. This looks like emission from a dye, OK? Somehow, that, that structure uh, suggests that you are making some, structure, you know, some kind of surface state that has uh, emission that looks like a dye. OK, so we said, well, that's interesting. Can you make these kinds of things in the solid state? So this is where Rosina Wu started working on this. And so she started to try to make these uh, optical limiting goggles, you can see. And so here, uh, the point of this is, if you're not familiar with optical limiting, is that you would like to find some material that's fairly transparent. And um, when you shoot normal uh, you know, light like this, room light, it's fine. You can read on the paper. Um, but when someone tries to shoot a laser right directly into your eye, it absorbs all the, the light, right? And so um, this is still a goal. And so you, don't, you would not like to have dark sunglasses when you're reading your normal paper, right? And so, um, so yes, yeah, so she was able to make a material that was semi-transparent and have these enormous optical limiting properties and look at the different types of uh, properties that you can see based on the separation between these clusters. So if you can actually control the separation based on the concentration, aggregation effects, and surface topology, um, then you can actually have materials that are look transparent but still have these enormous optical limiting properties. So Narenga Abenasinga uh, was a, uh, also graduated. He graduated last year. Um, and he investigated the single cluster fluorescence properties doing this two-photon near-field optical micro microscopy. And uh, he was able to quantify the two-photon cross-section for a single cluster, right? And, and show it's exactly how large this, these enormous. And the thing is, these particles, because of their topology and because they're made of gold, um, shooting light on them is not like shooting light on a single die. So people are always wary that if you do imaging and so on, and if you keep ba you know, banging on it with a femtosecond laser on the same dye molecule, you're going to disrupt it, right? Um, these, big, these clusters somehow can handle that. They're very stable, very, very brilliant uh, fluorescent, and he showed that. So that was Narenga. All right, so the next question is uh, we had shown that gold, that based on the size, has different properties in gold particles. And then silver, based on its electronic structure, would have guessed that it would have similar particles to gold, but actually is different. Um, and then we, we show some you know, properties of these systems in the solid state and for the single cluster. What happens when you start to bring two clusters close to each other? So this is where uh, Rosina was really interested in this question. And in order to do this, we have to go through a lot of inf interesting new kinds of collaborations, which I'll mention. OK, and so, um, but the idea, of course, was to control this separation by putting uh, a dye molecule in between the two. Not only controlling the separation, but also, is it possible that you could have organic bit interact with the metal bit? And especially so if the metal bit is now starting to behave like a semiconductor. So she had to figure out a way to attach these metal clusters together. And uh, here's a gold 25, and here's this TBT small chromophore, which we could later make the big chromophore with, but proof of concept first. And then you attach the TBT, and then you can do this ligand exchange reaction, and then you do the kind of um, process, which I'll tell you in a second, but then you can make these oligomers. You can make these oligomers, and you can see um, we, we learned some, she bought these things, and we learned something from our biochemists about how to use this um, page gel electrophoresis kind of technique uh, 
to separate these structures. And um, you separate them based on the bands, and of course the bands that fall to the bottom, if you've used page before, the ones that fall to the bottom are the lightest, and the ones that stay at the top are the heaviest, I think. <laughs> I didn't do it, obviously. So. All right, so, but the interesting thing, of course, is that later we collaborated with, in our department, um, with mass spec. And uh, here's where the real genius was, um, to try to figure out the mass spec fragmentation pattern of two gold clusters with 25 atoms. It's a, it's a huge mathematical problem, right? Um, but he did it, and um, we were able to find, of course, we knew already what the gold 25 mass spec looked like, but then for the dimer and trimer and, and other bigger oligomers, he had to go through quite a bit of analysis. And so we found that you could make those. Um, there's somebody here from um, our facilities unit that does, um, so Kai Soon is uh, actually over, in, in, uh, over here in the engineering, and then he was very interested in doing uh, TEM on these structures. Um, so he did TEM uh, actually for a previous paper with Nuranga, I showed you already, on the Gold 25, so he did that again, and then he tried to compare the spacing between these clusters with this structure here, saying that in this case the spacing should be smaller if you're gonna bring them in by a single dye molecule. And then he used this kind of histogram approach to prove that, that he had actually seen that. So, kind of cool. Um, but, you know, what happened? <laughs> we made these things and now you have a gold dye, gold, gold cluster dye, gold cluster uh, topology. Uh, you have dimers and trimers. You can look at the absorption, right, and see where the dye was absorbing. You can look at uh, the absorption coefficient for the different things that you made, okay? For example, um, the, the um, band one is just the do, uh, gold cluster, but band two now has got the gold cluster, um, you know, the, the dimer, if you will, and then this, this is other structures. So, you know, from an absorption standpoint, it looks like you made a lot of um, gold dimers. So, um, again, you can look at the emission, the normalized fluorescence, Rosina did a very nice job, and there's something interesting here. So if you look at the excitation of the um, dye, so you, you excite the dye, then you can look at the excitation, I mean the fluorescence from this gold dye, gold dye um, oligomer. But interestingly, if you were to excite the gold 25 directly, you actually don't see any emission. So I'll say that again. So if you excite the gold 25, okay, directly, then at this wavelength, you don't see any emission. But if you excite the dye, then you see very large emission. Only where the, and then if you excite the dye where, you know, the emission from the dye is in this region, the emission from the gold is in this region, but you, there is no excitation for the gold cluster at 265. It must have had an energy transfer. It must have had an energy transfer. So, and then you can look at the two photon properties, okay? And so those two photons are very large again. Um, and, you know, this is just showing that you have two photon. But the big um, point was to make is that the two photon cross sections are enhanced by 68 times with respect to the ligamer, 68 times bigger, um, which is also another big result, okay? And so then she did the time resolved spectroscopy, the transient, like we talked about before, on these uh, interesting new oligomer structures to try to conclude what was happening. And so here's her picture. And so it's a nice picture. Here's the dye. We want to excite the dye and see what happens to the metal. So you excite the dye, it's down in the, U, it's down in the UV, and then there's an energy transfer to the metal ligand state of these metal clusters. And that's what gives rise to that fluorescence that you saw. And if you excite the clusters directly, of course you don't see as much efficient transfer to the TBT. So I think that was really interesting. It proves the point that for specific optical properties can be achieved by controlling the design of the metal cluster network. So um, I've shown you something about metal, gold metal clusters and their size dependence and they're different from particles. And in silver, 
is the same electronic structure almost, but has different properties um, that you can tailor. And then now, if you can make a topology with a gold and a dye, that you can actually change the properties of them also. Um, uh, a fellow in Singapore said, well, what if I could make a cluster with two different metals? And so, um, is it possible to make a magic number with two different metals? And he did. And so, you can make um, the gold 25 silver, the gold 18 silver, or the gold 15 silver. As long as it follows that formula, it's a magic number. And look what happens, actually, interestingly, for the case of just looking at gold 25, I already told you that was enhanced. If you make a gold 25 silver mixed cluster, look at the fluorescence in that case. It's huge. So we're still working on these things. Okay, so I think my time's almost up. Let me give you a few minutes to say what we've done with these things. So Sung Hai was very interested um, in, in applications. Uh, the university was very interested in filing a patent on these clusters, mainly from their ability to tailor the outside. Um, in one case, you can actually look at the uh, tailoring for different antibodies and proteins. Um, we got interested in photodynamic therapy. Other people are looking at bioimaging and antibacterial kind of effects. The interesting thing about using these for photodynamic therapy is that in the most cases when you do PDT, you need to have the sensitizer and then the drug. Two different things, right? Uh, the, the thing that carries the drug and then the actual drug itself. And so in this case, the Gold 25 worked as the drug and, and sensitizer both. And um, I'm going a little bit quick, but we had to go through these kinds of things of dealing with the uh, singlet oxygen generation. If you look at the singlet oxygen generation compared to uh, organic photosynthesizers like uh, Photofren, um, this is about two orders of magnitude larger very potent single oxygen generator material. And so how does it look? You can actually uh, endocytose gold 25 into cells and you can image it. This is just regular two photon imaging of that and it looks very, very efficient endocytose pr uh, process. And then um, you can, with two photon uh, excitation, you can see uh, the destruction of the cells from the formation of the single oxygen on the cell membrane. So Sunghai was very interested in doing this. Uh, this paper was just published just recently only because of all the patent and, and then some interest in licensing this kind of technology. Rosina also was very interested in these properties and still has worked with these kinds of structures as well as other clusters. It, indeed, because of that gigantic cross-section, because of that smallness and because of its um, band gap nature, these clusters act like gigantic molecules. They act like gigantic molecules. All right, so there are some other applications. We're still working on optical limiting in these systems. Um, so the, um, with the Army Research Office, still very excited about this, um, that you can make completely transparent optical limiting materials. Um, there's some people interested in doing electronics um, and imaging. I think I've talked about that quite a bit. There's also some interest in uh, solar for these use of these. Uh, I know some people have used particles to do solar, but um, there has been some interest in the, in the literature uh, to use these for clusters. And then uh, uh, finally, um, you know, these clusters of course have a lot of potential in catalysis. Um, I know there's some people in material science and other around campus interested in catalysis, but um, the, catal the catalytic behavior of these structures is supposed to be uh, phenomenal and uh, understanding how the um, catal catalytic pro property happens in certain reactions is still a matter of debate, which means more research needed, which is a good thing for us. Um, and so, um, but it's also a possibility of, for collaboration. So in conclusion, um, I think we can see that metal clusters show quantized absorption spectra, and they are different than big particles. Uh, I think we've shown that. And then metal, they show enhanced fluorescence emission and their particle counter, then their particle counterparts, and they can, can be considered as metal quantum dots. Um, they, they involve unique excitations of energy transfer pathways involving both the core atoms and the staple shell. This is the energy transfer process. Um, and so they still have some of the largest two-photon cross-sections ever measured. 
and um, metal clusters can be tailored to have properties of other metals. That's like maybe the biggest sentence ever, right? So, um, and then clusters can be combined to make unique metal cluster chromophore oligomers, and they showed enhanced optical properties via Rosina's work. And then this drug, so the, um, you know, this actually can be used as a drug in PDDP, uh, DP, DT application, excuse me, with high efficiency for promoting single oxygen. And the optical lim limiting performance of metal clusters is still one of the very best in the visible and near IR regions with nanosecond and femtosecond pulses. And finally, metal clusters can be used in all these other applications as well. So let me just conclude by pointing out the people I already mentioned, Oleg Varnowski, who's here, Sung Hai, who's moved on now in Boston, Rosina, who will be at Northwestern next semester. Uh, Ramakrishna is at Western Michigan. Um, let's see, Naranga is at uh, University of Colombo. He's in, in Sri Lanka. Uh, I think the, the rest of the people. Um, Cosito is here. I told him I would mention him in the talk somehow. right? You know, and, um, and all the rest of the group have done a phenomenal job on these clusters. And thank you for your attention. <laughs>